All right. Wonderful. I think it's about that time. It's 5.02. People still cycle in, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, My name is Matt Sala. I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions here at the Villanova University Charles Woodrow School of Law. Located in the Philadelphia suburbs, Villanova Law is within a short commutable distance to several major legal markets, including Delaware, New York City, and D.C., And with about one in five of our students coming from STEM backgrounds, which is among the highest concentrations in the country, more and more applicants are attracted to Villanova for its IP program and other offerings. And tonight we have a special program planned for you that we hope will provide you with an in-depth view into our intellectual property law program and the breadth of opportunities that hopefully await you as potential future Villanova law students. And joining us are three members of our law school community, Uh, Dean Risch, who is the Vice Dean and Faculty Director of our RP Law Concentration, as well as two students uh, who will provide firsthand knowledge of the courses, the experiential learning community, and more here at Villanova. And throughout tonight's discussion, uh, we really encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A function, and we will do our best to address all the questions posed tonight um, at the end um, and maybe even between. So to get it started, I'm going to hand it over to my boss and Villanova resident, I'm Peace Collar, uh, Dean Michael Risch, to introduce himself and provide a little bit of his background. Hi, good morning. Thank, thanks for uh, having me, and thank you all for joining. Uh, as Dean Sala said, my name is Michael Risch. I am a professor here. Uh, before I was vice dean, I was a professor. After I'm vice dean, I'll be a professor. Uh, I teach IP. Uh, my classes are the IP survey class, which is basically a list of all the a survey of all the classes, patent law, and an IP seminar. And I'll talk about all those classes later. Uh, as far as background goes, I do not actually have an engineering degree, but I practiced at a boutique IP firm representing startups and companies in litigation. Uh, We did a lot of patent, copyright, and uh, trademark and trade secret litigation. Uh, We started companies and taught them how to protect their intellectual property and and did that as well. Uh, I left uh, that practice to go into academia where I am happily now working with students uh, so they can go out and do the same thing as they see fit. Thanks, Dean Rich. Uh, so next, we'll kick it over to our Po Town and our Sinus uh, resident, Justin Vogel, to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Vogel, as Dean Sala said. Uh, I am a third year student here at Villanova, a member of the IP concentration. Uh, I graduated with a history degree from our Sinus College in 2015, worked for a brief period of time uh, in the clinical pharmaceutical testing industry, uh, and then completely unrelated to that, decided to go to law school. Uh, And when I came to law school, I was really interested in internet law. I thought it was a big deal then, it's going to be even bigger deal moving forward, and found out that it was housed within like the intellectual property, you know, sphere. Uh, And I've had a really great time learning more and more about all the different ways that uh, IP and law have intersected together and how you create and protect your own rights. Thanks, Justin. And now kicking it back to my old parts in New York City, uh, we're going to kick it over to Hadassah for an introduction. Hi, uh, my name is Hadassah Francis. I am also a third year law student at Villanova. Um, Like Justin, I have a non-science background. I was an English major undergrad and I minored in jazz studies. Um, After After that, I worked at a hospital for about two years, and then I came to law school, um, and I was specifically looking at schools that had um, a strong group of classes in the intellectual property um, range, and I have kind of fallen into the entertainment side of that, so I've been doing a lot of that lately. Thanks, Dasa. Was it the saxophone, right? Saxophone with some French background with some fluency. Got it. Uh, All right. So kind of to start things off, I know intellectual property is this very broad umbrella term for a lot of different things. So Dean Risch, I was hoping that you can kind of provide a brief overview as to 
actually what IP is for those who are thinking about it um, and just some of the opportunities that exist here at Villanova for our students and including the concentration. Sure, IP is a pretty broad term. Uh, it basically includes any product of the mind, hence the term intellectual property, any, any intangible asset. Uh, and so that can include things like patents, which are how we protect our ideas. It can include copyright, which is how we protect expression. It can include trademarks, which is how we protect the way we distinctively, uh, we distinctively uh, designate the, you know, our, the name of our products. It can include trade secrets, which is how we uh, protect the information we keep secret. And it includes a lot of other things. For example, we have design patents and we have plant patents and we have rights of publicity, et cetera. So we have a broad set of offerings at the law school, and this is all within the IP sphere, but we also have, as Justin said, related areas in Hadassah as well. We have internet law, because there's IP on the internet. We have entertainment law, there's IP in entertainment, but those areas have other things related to them that aren't IP. So the first thing we offer for folks who really want to go all in is a concentration. And the concentration gets you a little certificate and the, a, a, a really not, I don't even think we give an actual certificate. It's more de a demarcation on your transcript that says you've completed the concentration. And that requires a few things. It requires you to take a, the, some core classes, the IP survey class, which everybody should take anyway. It's basically a survey of all those four types of IP I just said. You have to take copyright law. You have to take patent law. And then you can take one other course in IP. That could be trademark law. It could be trade secret law. You have to take a research seminar related to IP. That could include the advanced IP seminar or it can include some other seminar where you write about IP, like the Supreme Court seminar or something. Everybody takes a research seminar at Villanova anyway. So the only thing that's different is you take your research seminar having to do with IP. You also have to take a practical writing class related to IP. Everybody at Villanova takes a practical writing class. You just take yours in IP. Our offerings are trademark practice, patent prosecution, IP licensing. And then you have to take what we call an ancillary class, a law and. So we've got law in the internet, law in entertainment, uh, fashion law. Um, boy, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember what else we've got. Um, there are several others, and I'm blanking on the other one. But those are the three. Oh, sports law is another big one. So between those four, that is like. 90% of our concentration students and probably 70% of all our students uh, take one of those anyway, because we have a lot, we attract lots of people who are interested in those areas anyway. And then you have to have experiential learning in IP. You can do that either in the entrepreneurship law clinic, which is a clinic that represents small business ventures. They don't see a huge amount of IP, but they see some IP. And so we count that. Or you can do it via externships, which is where many of our students go. This is with private firms or with companies where they go out and they can do any number of things. They can prosecute patents, they can do litigation, they can do licensing. It's a huge number of things. Everybody at Villanova does experiential learning. If you're in the concentration, you do all of your experiential learning in IP. Uh, sometimes that's with a, a clerking for a judge in Delaware where it's a heavy duty patent court. So these are all the course offerings we have. We have many other course offerings. We have tra trademark law. We have trade secret law. Uh, we have um, patent litigation. Uh, we have law of pharmaceuticals. We have got um, other IP related classes. So now if you're not that hardcore, you don't want to take that many classes. 
Well, then don't. You just take some of those. So we have had some people who went into IP. Now, by the way, you don't have to be afraid of the concentration. You can do it. As you heard, both Justin and Hadassah, they'll talk about their experiences, but they do both did patent. They do, both took patent law. They both did fine. They both survived it uh, and thrived, I would even say. Uh, but they don't have a science degree, and it's all good. Uh, maybe they go somewhere where they do uh, patent litigation. For Hadassah, that sounds unlikely because she wants to go into entertainment law. That's okay, but but she will at least have a taste. So if she has a client who's got an invention, she'll know what to do with it. Um, but we've had plenty of students who say, you know what, I don't want to do all that because I want to also do business. I want to also do uh, art. Oh yeah, we have art law. That also is one of our and classes. Um, I, I want to do other things. So I don't want to take everything. So we have people who take all the patent classes and sort of skip trademarks. We have people who take all the trademark classes and sort of skip patent. Uh, the menu is yours. If you don't do the concentration, the only thing that's missing is the little designation on your transcript. Thanks, Gamrish. So speaking about some of those opportunities, uh, Justin and Adasa, do you want to mention some of the classes that you've taken thus far and you know, not feeling the pressure to mention which one you, is your favorite based upon the professor who might be here right now? But uh, did you have a, a favorite class that you've taken in the IP space thus far? Uh, Justin, if you want to start us off. Sure. Um, to date, I've taken IP license or IP survey, uh, trademark practice, copyright, internet law, IP licensing, patent law, and I'm currently in the advanced IP seminar. So I've done, I've done a lot so far. Um, all provided very different uh, viewpoints into IP law, all provided uh, uh, a number of different professors I've had Dean, Professor R. Dean Rich three times now. Excellent, uh, excellent interactions each time, excellent classes. Uh, I think my favorite classes subject matter wise were both the copyright law class and the internet law class. Copyright law because copyright is a right guaranteed by the constitution, but then as a country, we've taken a very interesting view on copyrights. Uh, and have amended that law a number of times to be more in line with Europe and the rest of the world's view of copyrights. So seeing that tension and seeing the Supreme Court and other courts kind of wrestle with what should we protect and how is always really interesting for me, especially in the modern era. Uh, and then internet law, because as I said, I'm interested in internet law, but also because it sounds a little trite, but the internet really did change a very significant changed almost everything about how we interact with each other and how we interact with the law like from simple questions about you know, like how do you start a lawsuit or is it okay to sue someone who lives in California if I live in New York like the internet changed that in a really big way uh, so being able to kind of wrestle with those questions and see what Congress has done and what Congress has not done uh, was really really fascinating to me wonderful thanks Justin Hadassah yeah, so I've taken, um, Justin and I have actually been in class together a few times. So I've also taken IP survey, I've taken copyright, I've taken trademark, patent law. Um, I've also taken fashion law, and I'm currently taking entertainment law. Um, I don't know if I missed one, but I've pretty much, I think I've taken a lot of the IP classes um, so far. I think... Um, my favorites, I actually really liked patent law. I'm not saying that because Dean Rush is here, but I think it was really, I, I just thought it was really interesting and he made it very digestible. So I was able to be interested in it without having the science background. And I'm very like, I don't like numbers. I don't like science. Um, so I feel like me saying that says a lot. Um, and I also really enjoyed internet law, which um, I think we had both had with Professor freshman which it was just super interesting he's very very knowledgeable and the class was like extremely conversational and you know we were all able to kind of throw our ideas out there and I'm taking a privacy law seminar this um, semester where I'm kind of like digging into the internet aspect of things a little bit more so wonderful thank you yeah in addition to refreshment being just a a renowned IP scholar. He also has a wicked jump shot for those who play basketball. Um, but 
more related to the topic at hand. Uh, I know for Hadassah and for Justin, each of you has gotten involved with the different and various experiential learning opportunities within the IP space. But before delving down into that, uh, Dean Rish, I was hoping that you can provide like an overview uh, for those who don't know what a clinic is and what an externship is, and then what opportunities exist for, I, you mentioned it before, but what are some of the opportunities that exist here at Villanova for, for our students? Sure. So we require at least six credits of experiential learning. That's two, like three credit classes, but not necessarily. We've had students who spent a whole semester working full time for like fashion houses in New York, and they got more credits than that. Um, our clinic, a clinic is a small, basically firm within the law school. And so there are about eight students led by the professor who guides them. They typically work in pairs and they take on a client or two and they fulfill all the client's needs. So in the entrepreneurship law clinic, uh, there will be some small venture uh, who uh, will have some needs uh, that are that to grow and reach their goals, and your job is to help them. And like I said, uh, that can sometimes include intellectual property, but sometimes it includes financing, et cetera. So the thing about the Entrepreneurship Law Clinic is it's only eight students, two semesters, so it's 16 students, so there's a lottery to get in. So not everybody gets in because everybody in the business law concentration wants to take it as well. Um, and so it's a pretty popular clinic. We are, but there are other experiential opportunities. By the time you uh, reach, the, reach the year when you can do experiential, we hope to have other entrepreneurial and IP-based options available. I can't tell you what they look like yet, but we just uh, hired uh, Mary Sheila McDonald, who's the former dean of LaSalle Business School, but she also has a JD. And she is our new SCARPA professor of entrepreneurship and law. And she is developing a, a, a clinic-ish type experience for students to get uh, entrepreneurial experience. It won't be the small law firm style that our normal clinic does. Uh, it may be something different where you have more clients with smaller tasks, et cetera. She, still, she just started like literally a month ago. So she's still figuring out what that's gonna look like. By the time year two and three L's, we'll have that down. And so that will be a great opportunity. And we are really thrilled to be expanding our offerings for that. But then the vast majority of people will do what are called externships. Externships are where we send students out and they are supervised by practitioners out in the world. Uh, in a variety of areas. And we have externships in all manner of areas. We have people who work for the DA and we have people who work for the public defender. We have people who work for the government and we have people who work for private companies. We have people who work for law firms. We have people who work for public interest firms. In IP, it's whatever you can find. And we've got lots of things, right? Like I said, we have people who are doing IP for fashion houses. We send people to clerk. Uh, for Delaware district court judges uh, doing patents. Um, we have people doing licensing for small firms and all of this is geared toward education. It's, it's not an internship. It's not uh, labor where you go and you just work for free and do whatever they tell you. We only sign people up who are willing to give you tasks and then give you feedback on those tasks. And so those are those are some of the opportunities. Yeah, thanks, Dean Rich. And one important point that I'd like to mention that is a differentiator to some extent is for Villanova and our externship program, you are allowed to do externships with law firms and corporations. For a lot of law schools out there, they, if they do provide uh, actual uh, external externship placements, many times you're restricted to government agencies, public interest organizations, or judicial uh, externships. They don't necessarily offer um, the ability to extern with corporations or private 
private practice with law firms. So that's a unique aspect of Villanova's program that allows our students who are interested in going into the entertainment and media space or IP space to find pre-approved externship credits um, with a variety of different firms and corporations. And speaking of such, I know for Hadassah, you are currently, I believe, externing right now. Um, you get to do an externship before. Can you talk about your experience and where you've done an externships? Sure. So I have done two. I'm currently doing an externship. I did an externship last spring, and then I was an intern over the summer. So my first externship was with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is a hospital. Um, and a lot of people actually don't realize how much IP there is in healthcare. So I did actually a lot of like IP licensing type of research um, and things of that nature. So that was my first externship. Um, over the summer, I was with Atlantic Records um, and their business and legal affairs department, and um, that we deal with a lot of IP, mostly copyright, because you're dealing with artists and their name and likeness, and there are a lot of contracts um, that have to be uh produced and signed related to that using their name appearing on tv or whatever the case may be um when you're dealing with their music that's their intellectual property that's so um and obviously music has a lot of copyright as uh if you are, you know, the blurred lines case, and there are also other big cases when you're dealing with um, sampling, which occurs a lot um, now. And then currently, I am working for an entertainment firm um, that's based out of New York, um, which is also an externship. Um, and again, it's pretty much the same kind of thing as Atlantic Records, just instead of working for the label, I'm working for the artists and producers and things of that nature, but the same types of agreements, um, still dealing with a lot of copyright related matters. Wonderful. Thank you. And Justin, we were before this just started, we were talking about the work that you're currently doing with the CLE clinic. So can you talk a little bit about what that entails and, and what the demands of that are during the semester? Sure. Uh, so just sort of been a member of the clinic since the beginning of this semester. Um, the CFLE clinic is interesting because you you have less clients. So you get to focus a little more uh, closely with them and whatever their legal needs are. Um, I have one client right now I'm working very closely with them to try to like start a nonprofit and figure and like uh, try to figure out what that would look like for them. Um, so a little less IP related, but it's definitely bringing me into a body of law I otherwise would never have interacted with, um, to be honest. Uh, it's really interesting kind of see how state and federal law inter intersect on certain topics and what um, what you have to do to comply with all of these different agencies. Uh, previously, my first summer, I did an externship with a, a nonprofit group here in Philadelphia called the Philadelphia Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, and to get the phone name down, uh, where uh, I worked to connect uh, artists and arts organizations in Philly uh, with pro bono legal assistance. So I remember one case I had was an artist trying to get his painting or his, his culture back. He had like provided it for a gallery out of state and for an art show, and then the art show ended, and then they never sent it back. So I was trying to connect him with someone who would send a more official letter, like saying, please give me the art or you need to return the art. Uh, but also wrapped up in that, there was an update to the patent statute a few years ago that was attempting to make it easier for like individual kind of, you know, in their own garage on their own time inventors to actually get patents for their inventions. Uh, and Congress looked to partner or look to have a lot of nonprofits try and help people get those patents, which can be a bit of a long process. It can be a bit difficult uh, and not a whole lot. Like there's, there wasn't a huge amount of uh, nonprofits I could do this, but PBLA is one of them. Uh, they connect inventors all across the state with patent um, attorneys to try to help them get like, you know, what would be like one or two of their, of their inventions patented, uh, which was a really, like that was my first introduction to patent law even before I took the IP survey class. So that was a really cool thing to learn about. Awesome. And just sticking with you real quick, I uh, wanted to transition. We talked a lot about the different course opportunities, the experiential learning opportunities. 
Now, in terms of involvement as a student with organizations or op other opportunities, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, first and foremost, what is in of court, especially the Ben Franklin in of court, and uh, for you and Hadassah to talk a little bit about your experience with it. Sure. So the Ben Franklin in of court is this um, organization with so that's uh, Philly based. That's for a way for practitioners, law students, professors to all kind of meet and work with the, work with each other and discuss uh, IP specific issues. Uh, so they host meetings. I think effectively monthly throughout the year, especially through the, especially throughout the academic year, uh, where they kind of meet and discuss really big topics. Um, additionally, as law students, you get to join these, uh, you get to join the organization and you can sign up for what's called a pupillage group, where you work um, pretty closely with one, with like one practitioner and try to you know, discuss the, the, the IP issues, learn more about them. Um, I remember I attended uh, an intercourt session last, I think it was, it was last year, I can't remember if it was in the fall or the spring, where there was a really big um, internet trademark case that had come out uh, where it's saying like booking.com is an acceptable trademark. And that was the whole discussion. And it was that we had the, the pupillage group who was um, on call. For some reason, that's the phrase that's jumping to mind for this, for that meeting, did a little bit of a skit trying to showcase like this is some of the issues that clients might have. And here's how you can start to kind of understand this uh, new problem in trademark law. Anything to add to that, Hadassah? I don't have anything to add to that specifically, okay. but um, I was going to say outside of the classroom, I know um, last semester, myself and two other students who are part of the well, one graduated, um, but part of the IP concentration, we participated in the patent drafting competition, which is a national competition. And that was pretty cool. And again, I was able to participate. I was taking, I think I was taking um, patent law at the same time, but I was able to participate in that without, again, having an extensive science background. And it was a really great experience. Um, we did not make it to the next round, but it was still a really great experience. So there's definitely other things outside of the classroom that you can be involved in that is IP related. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, now kind of moving forward, uh, in addition to the student organizations, the experiential learning opportunities, the different courses, uh, another way in which students get involved on campus is with research opportunities. So Dean Risch, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what those opportunities look like at Villanova um, and if any students, particularly maybe on this panel, have helped assist you with doing research. Uh, yes, uh, but first, before I get to that, I, I would like to talk a little bit more about student opportunities. We do have the IP Law Student Asi Society, um, Law Student Association, I guess, and they do do things uh, throughout the year. I mention it in part because just yesterday they had the expert for Marvin Gaye in the Blurred Lines case speak. I don't Did either of you two go to that? Uh, Hadassah did. It was she was terrific. She explained why she why she went you know why she gave the testimony she did and she walked everybody through it and then she gave other examples and she talked. I mean, it was it was really eye opening. And I've taught that case for many years. And hearing the expert in the case speak was was really great. Um, so on to research opportunities. Yes. So there are two types of research opportunities. Um, the first is. Uh, everybody takes a research seminar. So everybody gets a research opportunity to write their own research paper. So it sounds like Hadassah is doing hers in a privacy seminar. And Justin, I know, is doing his in uh, the IP seminar. Um, and I say the IP seminar, it's actually called Advanced IP and Internet. So you can write it in IP or Internet law. It's just like a catch-all for basically a seminar where you can write about stuff you're interested in. So everybody writes a research paper. So that's one opportunity. But a second one, which is a really great opportunity, is to be a research assistant for a professor. And this can often be paid. In fact, it's usually paid. Um, the pay isn't earth shattering, but it's nice to have a paycheck. Um, 
and you can spend a summer or during the year researching a variety of things. Uh, Adasa has done this for me in the past, um, and I hope enjoyed it. She can talk about that herself. Um, but you get to dig deep into whatever the professors are working on. You can help, uh, you know, guide ideas or find out that things aren't working. Um, and so that can be a, a really useful opportunity. You can help folks uh, write a case book. Uh, so I tell the story I like to tell is not me. I actually didn't take the opportunity to be a research assistant and always regretted it. Uh, my wife, however, who went to law school was a research assistant for a professor and had her name in the case book because she did a bunch of work to help the case book happen. And I've, and I've usually given thanks to my research assistants who've helped me uh, do articles as well. Thank you. I mean, we have a ton of questions that are coming in at the moment, but um, we'll get to them uh, very shortly. But in terms of, you know, Villanova uh, specifically now, for each of you here, um, I was wondering, it, specifically for Justin and for Adasa, have you given thought um, as to now that you're in your third year as to what you want to be pursuing post-graduation um, now that you've taken this notable interest in intellectual property? I guess so. I guess I can speak first. Um, I think my goal has always been to work in-house, which means essentially working as a loyal lawyer for a company, um, but just as like an IP attorney. So for example, when I did work at um, CHOP, the Children's Hospital, they did on their legal team have an attorney who specifically dealt with IP. Um, so she would do all the trademark, all the copyright, any IP licensing things that came up. Um, I also know that, for example, Louis Vuitton, which is a fashion house that a few um, students have interned or externed at, they have IP attorneys. Um, they also have an IP internship. Um, so that's what I think I want to do. Um, probably more related in the music atmosphere, just because, like I said, I was a jazz studies minor. I really love music and I've been doing a lot of work in music. Um, so if I could do that, that would be my ideal um, job. If I could have like a dream job. Um, but most likely that won't happen right away. So I'm probably going to go, um, I'm looking at going to probably like an IP firm, probably like a boutique IP firm or a boutique entertainment firm after graduation. Uh, for me, I spent the past summer working with a firm that just does cybersecurity and data privacy issues, uh, which I didn't think existed. And my eyes were opened up to how often <laughs> ransomware attacks and cyber attacks are. Uh, it's not just the really big ones like Colonial Pipeline or uh, Kaseya that made really big headlines over the summer. It's happening all of the time to everyone, unfortunately. So realizing that that is a very robust um, body of law and also a robust practice really interested me. Um, and I'd like to go back to try to get back into that field. Uh, also, I'm still interested in doing kind of like IP litigation. So making sure like defending someone's rights that like they owned their trademark and it was valid and you should stop using something similar or like they have a copyright in that piece of writing or that piece of art and you need to stop you know sending it around to all your friends uh so things like that are where i hope to go wonderful thank you so um last question that kind of pertains to a question that was asked in the q a dean rich um you know what do you feel is particularly strong about Villanova's IP program slash concentration? And, you know, in terms of these students, prospective students or applicants right now who are thinking about law school, what should be something that they take into consideration when evaluating not just Villanova, but all law schools, if they're interested in pursuing a path in IP? So a couple things. First, I would say what I think is really strong is we, you know, for a school our size, we really punch above our weight with IP. We have a tremendous number of offerings available. Uh, it leads to very small classes, um, and which leads to good one-on-one -on -one contact, 
and it leads to quality teaching. Our adjuncts are really, really terrific. And when we've had adjuncts leave, we've brought in new adjuncts who are also really terrific. Um, and, and they really know the area. So that's one thing. So what, what you should want, want to be looking for is, does the school have a good variety of classes? Does it have a good variety of people who are interested in IP so that there are people like you? Are you in an area where you can find different kinds of IP experiences? Are you in an area where there's an IP in a court, for example? Are you in an area where there is patent and copyright and trademark? Are you close to other markets, right? We, for example, in, in Philadelphia, we're very close to Washington, D.C. and New York. We send students to each of those places every year, but they don't actually have to live in either of those places. Um, uh, and so these are, these are just some of the things uh, to consider. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, one plug I'll also mention is that a specific research I think uh, is fantastic at Villanova is the interdisciplinary nature and the collaborative culture that we have, not just at the law school, but with all across campus with our various programs. So, you know, we join partnership with what's called ICE or our, I'm trying to remember, Institute for uh, Create Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship Institute. Uh, so for them, they have different programs and innovate uh, and initiatives. They have an incubator program that helps out local entrepreneurs, um, something that we're partnering with, with our Scarpa Center for Law and Entrepreneurship. We also offer an immersion program called Villanova in the Valley for undergraduate students and graduate students, but for law students as well, uh, which is basically a two week um, long uh, 20 site visit um, experience over in Silicon Valley. Uh, as a way for students to get to, to network with Villanova alumni who are currently practicing at major firms uh, with C-level executives, with industry-leading organizations, with huge tech companies, um, just as a way to kind of get to know what the day-to-day -day life of these attorneys look like, as well as with other practitioners, and to, you know, gain, um, you know, insight and you know, network with folks who work in positions that you see yourself wanting to go into one day. Um, besides that, uh, we also offer a, a program called Villanova in a Hill. So if you're more interested in going to the DC uh, market, we also offer a similar program over in DC, which does something similar. Um, and other than that, just a lot of opportunities to connect with others through uh, our networking program and our great prof three-year professional development program. Um, but with that being said, it's now 20 minutes to go, but we have several, several questions in the chat box that we'd love to get to. So if you still have more questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, first up, we have Stephanie who asks, what experiential opportunities are available for students interested in pharmaceutical slash life sciences patent law? Um, I mean, off the top of my head, I know you know, I'm just thinking about some of the graduates uh, who are currently working in this space. So you have um, Jeffrey Pott, who's the general counsel for AstraZeneca. You have Bryant Lim, who teaches one of the classes here at Villanova, which is the Law of Drugs and Biologics, who's a board member for Life Sciences Pennsylvania, and he's currently the senior vice president for Adira, Adira Pharmaceuticals. I know we have a well, we have an externship uh, specifically with um, Glasgow Smith Klein, with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, with a boutique um, uh, health law firm Warren and McGraw. Uh, in addition to a few others. Uh, Dean Rush, is there something I'm forgetting here? No, you answered that much better. I was going to answer it, but you did a much better job. So thank you. We have, a, yeah. there's a lot of pharma in this area. There's a lot of pharma and, you know, it doesn't hurt that our, that the general counsel of AstraZeneca is one of our grads. Yeah, and the associate counsel for, um, uh, I believe it's Glasgow Smith as well. So we have. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, uh, just tons and tons and tons of people in this space. And as Dean Rich was mentioning, you know, New Jersey, Philadelphia, it's the pharmaceutical headquarter capital of the country. So there's just so many organizations and places to find work here. And a lot of graduates are currently working in this space. Um, I guess, uh, Hadassah, given your nature, you can answer this question from Joy. For externships, are students allowed to participate during the school year and over the summer, or is it specific to a certain time of year? Um, it's... 
any time of year. You can do it over the summer. You can do it during the school year. Um, if you find a firm that you really like and you want to be an extern, the externship coordinator, um, Matt McGovern, he's really, really, really great at working with you um, to, you know, approve different externships if it's something that you're really, really interested in. So you can do it any time of the year, though. Correct. Yeah. Any time of year, with the exception of your first year of law school, no matter where you go to law school, whether it's Villanova or somewhere else for some particular reason, um, the American Bar Association or ABA does not allow first year law students in their fall and spring semester to pursue an externship or join a clinic. So um, your first year will be pretty much all classes uh, at the law school that you will be attending. Um, but after that, as soon as your first summer, as uh, Justin did, you can start externing for different organizations. Um, next up, we have a question that I guess I'll pose this to Dean Rich. What are some of the main firms or companies that Villanova JD graduates with this focus uh, in terms of intellectual property are recruited by, or I guess go to? So, so, so the patent people typically go to a lot of the big firms in the area. We've got Baker Hostetler. Um, you know, we've got uh, Dwayne Morris, uh, et cetera. Um, so, so patent is sort of, there's, there's some big, but there's also smaller firms. The copyright and trademark is, is a little bit more diffuse because there's not as much firm hiring in, co in copyright and trademark like you know, en masse. So you've got to kind of pick and choose where you find it. So there's no one company or firm. It's really when there's an opening, where there's an opening, you've got to kind of find it. Um, and, and, and so that you, you find a little bit more diffuse than just Philadelphia. Um, you see a few more people going to New York to various mid-sized firms, firms you've probably not heard of. Um, and so, and, and so, for, for those areas, um, it, it really is a broad mix. They don't, they don't hire big classes of, of patent folks the way the patent folks do. So I don't know, I don't know if it's that helpful. It all depends on, on where the need is at any given time. And we'll get, it'll, be, it'll just pop up where some firms like, do you have any, do you have any, and the, the next two questions is gonna tie to this, right? So. Uh, we'll have people just say, well, do you have somebody who's, you know, got, got chemistry background? And if we do, it's great. Uh, we often don't because they already have jobs. Um, uh, and the same is true for the other areas. But, but, but our, you know, career strategy office sends out, you know, five to seven, even now for our, even now for folks who, who are, who just graduated, she's sending out several new openings every week and, and any one of those could be related to IP. Yeah, and you kind of were touching upon this. Um, what's funny is that when I interview candidates and I find out they come from a STEM background and are interested in being a patent agent, I always recommend if they have the time before law school to take the patent bar. Um, but Aaron asks, uh, he, he wants to, or he's been working as a patent engineer uh, with his bachelor's in EE or electrical engineering for a little over a year, and he's deciding whether uh, when to become a patent agent. So recommending, he wants to know if we would recommend taking the patent bar prior to starting law school. So I think it's a mixed bag. It depends on whether you want to work during your 1L year. Uh, you know, it, and it also depends on how easy it comes to you. I often tell students to wait until after their 2L year when they've taken patent law because they actually understand patents at that point. But I have many, many students who've taken it before law school or before their uh, before uh, their uh, second year. I will tell you, if you do that, you will have work. You will have paying work from day one in law school. You will probably have a permanent job before the end of your 1L summer. Um, we routinely get calls saying, can you recommend an electrical engineer for us? And, I, and I'm like, you should have asked for that two years ago because we don't get that many of them. When we do, they have jobs after their 1L year. So uh, you're in a good place to be. You can, you can, you can be a member, uh, a patent agent uh, and, and get some benefit out of that. Yeah, we had, a, what was it, Mark Bell, right? That had his PhD in neuroscience and was a patent agent 
during law school, it was working a few hours, uh, about six or eight hours uh, a week, uh, putting in some time. And now he's a patent attorney over at a major law firm in Philadelphia. Um, and then we just had an incoming student uh, or a 1L that just uh, passed the patent bar right before he started and another one who's taking it during the summer after his first year. So again, it, it's a it's a value add. It always looks good on a resume because it's in high demand because as Dean Rich was mentioning, there's not a ton of STEM majors that enter into the profession. So it is something that is a growing field and more and more people with hard science backgrounds are, are being looked at, which is why it's always nice that you know, just under 20% of our students come with a hard science background. Um, we have uh, one other question that's sort of on the same line from Aaron. Uh, he says he's a chemistry major uh, and he was wondering if there's any truth in needing a PhD to prosecute patents and getting hired. So not really. Um, th th where that comes from is more in bio. If you want to do biotech, they say you got to have a PhD in bio. Although I will tell you that we had somebody who just had a BA in bio and she asked me that same question and she's, she's already graduated in lateral to two firms. Um, although I don't think she's doing patent prosecution. She, I, I think she might even be doing trademark because she likes it better. But the answer is if you have a, if you have a, if you have a degree in chemistry, you will find a job. Uh, and quite frankly, and, and there are no guarantees. So I guess we're recording this, no guarantees. I, the last time I had somebody with a, with a science degree who passed the patent bar not get a job was maybe during the recession of 2013. Uh, so we, we put, I can't, and it's, it's harder if you're in copyright trademark. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not going to lie to you, but if you have that science degree and you put your patent bar number at the top of your resume, you're going to find a job. Perfect. Uh, we have a somewhat tangentially related question that I can answer. Um, they're asking about the different joint degrees offered and if it would be beneficial to complete one rather than a GD alone. Um, and the typical lawyerly answer is it, it really depends. So we do offer a few different joint degree programs, all of which that can still be completed in three years. So we have a three-year GD MBA and MPA program um, that you don't have to apply to until the end of March of your first year. So you can have a a good assessment as to how your first semester of law school went, what your interests are after speaking with attorneys, attending a number of practice area roundtables. You can find out like what is the value add of this additional degree and can it potentially move the needle a little bit more than my GD alone? Because if you realize, you know, it's not going to be super helpful in terms of getting you a normal job as an attorney in this that a GD alone could do, then why do the dual degree um, if it's just going to add a little bit more money and time on top of your JD alone. So uh, the greatest benefit is that you can graduate in the, still in the same three years it would take you to get your JD, and it saves you a considerable amount of money off of the second degree. So the JD MBA program saves you roughly uh, close to 15K off of the MBA because nine credits get double counted towards the MBA, and a similar amount of credits get double counted towards the MPA. We also have a GD LLM in taxation, as well as a GD LLM in international studies, which is where you spend your third year abroad. Um, and in the same potential three years, maybe three and a half, uh, you can graduate from two different law schools in two different countries uh, and for not a considerable amount more money. Thankfully, international law schools are way less expensive than American law schools. Um, so those are the various ones that we offer. Uh, if you have more questions, just feel free to reach out. Um, we have a question from Jackson asking, would a background in web development prior to the completion of uh, their bachelor's be conducive to IP in the same way? Sure. <laughs> I mean, you have a background in how, how web pages get made, right? So one of the big issues on the internet is how images get shared. There's a big fight now about whether resharing uh, a LinkedIn link, uh, who's liable for that, uh, it, not a LinkedIn, an Instagram link, uh, image via link, you know, uh, in, an image tag, essentially. Um, understanding what an image tag is and what, what an embed is, et cetera, can be useful in understanding both copyright law and internet law. So there's, there's you know, there's no harm in that. And had a question specifically for you, Dean, um, about your IP practical writing. Um, can you explain what that is? 
Sure. So I talked about the research paper. That's the seminar. So we also have practical writing, which is you have to do some writing. It's not a big research paper. It's more the type of writing you would do in practice. And so we have a huge variety of practical writing courses. If you take the clinic, that satisfies your practical writing. But you also have licensing courses, the trademark practice courses. It's sort of practical writing because you're writing you know, office actions to the trademark office. Patent prosecution is practical writing. You're, you're writing patent applications. So it's basically any kind of writing that you do in practice that's not a research paper. And so those are the IP ones. There's all sorts of practical writing classes all over uh, the law school in a variety of different fields um, that are like that, that are basically just non-research writing classes related to your practice. And last question that I see here is, uh, are there any international opportunities for patent law? Uh, Yes, we don't have a lot of international patent law courses. Um, there are oppor some opportunities, especially in summer programs. Sometimes you can go internationally and take an international IP class at some other school's international class. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, we don't, it's not like we have a huge footprint with international firms, but if you come and do well and you get placed at a firm that's doing prosecution, you will be doing international patent because everything is done internationally, um, right? Nobody just files in one country anymore. And so you will be doing some international patent. And the bigger firm you're at, the more likely you are to do international litigation. Well, well thank you all for taking the time this evening uh, to you know, address a lot of the questions uh, about the intellectual property law program here at Villanova. Greatly appreciate you, Justin, Hadassah, Dean Rich, uh, for spending this evening with us. Um, this is recorded, so if um, you want to go back and review any of this or you join late, um, it will be up on our website by the end of this week. Uh, in the meantime, if there's any questions, just feel free to send us an email uh, to the admissions office and we'll be happy to answer. I know there was a question in the chat box. I got back to them directly. Uh, so happy to you know, have everyone out tonight. Best of luck if you're going through the admissions process right now. Uh, and otherwise, enjoy the rest of your evening. And we look forward to hopefully welcoming the Villanova soon.